So uh, if you are watching us live or you're just watching in, uh, you're probably seeing us go ahead and mess around with technology and all that stuff. Um, hi there, I'm Denny. Uh, welcome to the tech chat with uh, Simon and Denny. Uh, basically, we're here to talk about uh, our experiences from the standpoint of SQL Server and BI to uh, Spark, Delta Lake, and Lake Houses. Uh, so basically, we wanted to go ahead and ha have you guys um, uh, chat uh, if you'd love to. Sorry, as it looks like. There we go. All good? Oh. Oh, there we go. Okay, so this is what happens when you have double whammies. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, now that we've went ahead and survived our technical uh, issues, uh, if you have any questions, please prop them into the chat or the Q&A. And for those of you on YouTube Live, go ahead and chime there as well. Uh, we'll I'll be monitoring the YouTube Live. Uh, Simon and I will be monitor monitoring the Q&A when the other person isn't talking, basically. <laughs> So, Simon, without further ado, let's go ahead and start with you. And why don't you have you uh, have you introduce yourself and let everybody know who you are and why are you even involved with this silly little endeavor here? Yeah. Okay. So, hello. I'm Simon Wiley. Hi. Uh, yeah. Who am I? I don't know. I'm just a tech nerd, Spark person thing. Um, so, I run a consultancy in the UK. Um, but generally, I'm getting around all over the place at the moment. So clients in the US, clients in Europe, clients all over the place, because there's lots of people suddenly doing lakes and Spark and big data stuff that haven't gone there previously. Uh, and that's kind of what I spend most of my time doing, going around, helping people out, learn Spark, learn how it integrates with the rest of Microsoft Azure. I'm a Microsoft MVP, so I spend lots of time doing Microsoft stuff and talk to those guys about web product directions and all that kind of stuff. And I've recently started making lots and lots of YouTube videos about the stuff that we know and we like, which happens to be Databricks. Hence why I'm suddenly talking to lots of Databricks people. <laughs> Rock on. Well, okay, then that actually is a good segue to myself. Uh, my name is Denny Lee. I am a developer advocate at Databricks. I am a former SQL Server guy myself, uh, literally SQL Server as in I was part of the SQL Server team itself. I was the... My goodness, what was my title? Uh, SQL, SQL Customer Advisor Team D, Data Warehousing and BI Lead. I think that was, that's why it's such a hard time figuring out what the heck I, what the heck I is because it's some <laughs> asinine title. But nevertheless, uh, <clears throat> uh, the context is I worked with some of the largest enterprises uh, that use SQL Server. I was post-sales, not pre-sales. Uh, I'm there to go ahead and help you get the max out of SQL Server. Um, so... Yeah, and then uh, due to a story, which actually I'll probably talk about a little bit later, um, I went ahead and made that transition into Spark. Uh, was fortunate enough to be able to join Databricks because this is an awesome company. Uh, and then just like Simon, I'm really interested in having the conversations about how you work within the context of both the Microsoft Azure world and also the Databricks Spark Delta Lake, you know, Lake House world, right? And the fact is that those concepts actually aren't that far apart, right? In, in fact, they're the, at least from where I'm coming from, I'm sure Simon and I have slightly different experiences, um, but the, the fact is there's a lot of similarities and the transition, while in some cases a little rough, the transition wasn't actually that bad to go from one to the other. And so in fact, that's probably really the basis for the first question, which is, you know, uh, uh, that, uh, that we wanna ask, which is, and by the way, when you, please do continue asking questions inside the chat and Q&A, we're gonna go ahead and definitely answer them. It's just that we're gonna probably gonna start with a, a little bit of a, not a script because we're, we're, we have no script by the way. So just, uh, this is completely live. And so if you hear my three-year-old in the background, that's live, you're listening to my three-year-old in the background, right? So uh, the idea was more a matter of like, we, we had some things that we want to cover first just to provide some context. And then we want to definitely dive into the questions. So definitely chime in and put your questions in. Um, but then, yeah, I mean, Simon, I think maybe the first thing we should be talking about a little bit now that people have some background of who we are is what, like, what was your first data job? Like not first job, like not newspaper boy, like or anything like that, just first data job versus, and how does that compare to your current job uh, that what you're doing right now? Yeah. Um, 
I mean, I think I started in the same place that so many people started uh, in just like as, you know, reporting grunt in a support team, right? So fresh out of uni, I'd done like sort of business and stats and all that kind of stuff. Um, I did a, I did a, I was one of the year intern things at IBM. And at the time then it was like balanced between CRM and like some reporting. And it was like, you know, your job for this week, you know, it's like, it was like three days a week. I was meant to be making a, basically building a report using Lotus one, two, three in the dark side. Um, and it was like, manage all this data together, copy that column over. And it's like a giant script of manual things to do to then put data into a report. And I was like, so I was there for like a month, just like going, just chopping and changing columns around. And then I was like, have we ever asked if we can just get it in the right format? Like, no, 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 it's a big report. You've got lots of people, we can't change it. And I spoke to the person who made that report and they're like, you're literally the only users. <laughs> like they had no idea that this whole job existed to receive this pre-canned report, chop and change it and put it, and he's like, do you want it, do you want it in the new state? I was like, yes. Right. And then that was like three days of work. And they're like, what are we going to do with you? <laughs> just like, <laughs> Uh, and they had this whole Lotus Notes, uh, playing from emails, turning it into, like, putting it into a reporting system, basically. So, okay. like, sucking down from their CRM system, and then they could do, like, views, which were, like, little reports and, like, little sales dashboards. And I just took that and started building and building. And, like, at the end of that year, that was, like, their fully-fledged reporting tool they did a load of stuff in. So I went back to uni for a year and then kicked off, joined, like, uh, support and stuff, doing a little bit of CRM. And loads and loads of reporting. And then that was SQL Server. And that was like Microsoft BI. Well, actually at that point, it was Access. You know, Monday morning, every Monday, it's run the giant Access database of Doom that spits out a load of Access reports. And it takes the entire day cranking out PDFs. And, you know, world of pain. And eventually migrated that over SQL Server, started learning about BI, started introducing MDX queue, but it was just kind of, you know, that slowly learning that stuff. And that was so internal. I was there for like six, seven years, just again, like to learning little bits. But at that point, it wasn't at all involved in the community. You know, I didn't kind of get out there and go to meetups and go to talks. So we kind of like scratching together what we knew and kind of just could learn. And then left, looked outside and went, oh, okay. Yeah, we could have been doing this a whole lot differently. And then, yeah, after that, Microsoft BI and onwards. But yeah, it's, uh, I think a lot of people have had that. Monday morning, it's your job to make sure all the reports go out kind of pain. <laughs> no, I actually absolutely 1000% agree with you on that one. I mean, the reality is like whenever you start talking about data projects, right? That's exactly it. Now, I mean, I'll admittedly enough did not go from Lotus 1, 2, 3. That, that was not my <laughs> background, but nevertheless, um, I definitely went ahead and um, one of my first jobs basically was uh, just to do web analytics. And so I was actually like, before I did, like the, the first job I actually want to talk about at least and, and because before that was just sort of like, you know, tossing some data inside a database. I, I did play with, um, with cubes actually, actually, no, maybe I should talk about the first one because in fact, actually I just realized my first one actually was part of Microsoft IT. And okay. yeah, yeah. And so the, what was interesting about Microsoft IT was that we were actually the first team to build the very first OLAP cube, like the very first analysis cube ever. It was yeah. back to, this is back when like, you know, Microsoft had purchased that portion of Panorama software mm -hmm. and uh, the Nets brothers had, uh, had come from, uh, from Israel <laughs> over to Redmond. And literally, I was on the team. It was myself. There was a guy named Jim Berg. Uh, so shout out to Jim if he happens to be online right now. Uh, we were, uh, uh, um, um, and Dave Shuba. Oh, I definitely want to give a shout out to him. Uh, where we basically went ahead and, uh, as part of Microsoft H uh, IT in, in HR, like you know, you know, human resources. All right, this is back in the time where basically the hierarchy from Bill Gates to myself, little old me, was only seven levels. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, so we built the first analysis. Oh, uh, sorry. OLAP services at the time. Q. And so that's how I got into it. And then slowly, because of that, the transition went into uh, web analytics. And so mm -hmm. that's actually where I was sort of introduced to the idea of distributed computing early on. Even though we didn't, we didn't have Hadoop or anything like that. It just was just more the 
this idea of a concept of doing that basically. And then that transition to, uh, because I was doing web analytics and I was constantly dealing with very large queues, that transition to basically building uh, the um, joining Bing to help them build like really large um, SQL server and analysis services instances. Uh, we then uh, at the time uh, with a buddy of mine named Bilal Obadat, he, he's actually a, a solution architect here at Databricks as well. Um, we built the, at the time, uh, the largest queue at Ad Center at 6.5 terabytes or 6.1 terabytes or whatever it was. And then, uh, and that was a cube at size. And that transitioned into uh, the awesomeness Yahoo cube. Yeah. That's the, yeah, exactly. That's the, so for those of you who don't know what that is, the Yahoo cube, at least in the BI, C, Microsoft SQL Server BI uh, side of the house, that is a 24 terabyte cube that was on top of a 5,000 node Hadoop cluster um, with like a massively large Oracle rack as its staging server, actually, which is, which is amazingly painful. Um, it <laughs> yeah, it was just, exactly. It was just a tad painful. So, and so, yeah, it turned out to be the largest cube and that actually shortly after we built that, uh, that's actually when I got introduced to Spark, <laughs> right? Because the Yahoo team was going like, Let's stop transferring all of that data from the 5,000 node Hadoop cluster over to this one cube, right? The, and just to give you some context, I mean, and this sort of leads to our next, uh, the, the next, uh, you know, quote unquote question or a script here. Um, it took us 72 hours just to process a quarter's <laughs> worth of data. So if we couldn't, if if there was just one mistake on it, like just one mistake, uh, it literally would go ahead and kill off two weeks for us to figure out what the heck happened, reprocess, reprocess, reprocess. So that's what led us to the idea that, huh, maybe this isn't the best idea to build such a large <laughs> cube, right? So, so anyways, that led to Spark and then but bada bing, bada boom. So here, here, here's, here's where we're at. So... All right, which which is an excellent segue because uh, I have plenty of stories, but I want to start with your story, Simon. Tales from the trenches. Like, what are some of the issues that we got into? And then I think we actually have some uh, a Q and A here from Bob that actually probably would be very applicable here for us to talk about things like how important is ETL and data wrangling to get things done? You know, like yeah. So uh, yeah. So what? Would you start with that? Yeah. So there's one in the Q and A as well about what actually is a lake house, and we're going to get to that later. So yes, like, exactly. We'll, we'll, we'll get to that to the later. So yeah, sorry. Yeah, we're going to answer live on that one. Uh, so I, we apologize. I, I apologize for going ahead and not chiming that out. So go ahead. Uh, Tales from the uh, trenches. Some of the pain and the the, uh, the headaches that you've been going through uh, yourself, Simon. I mean, so yeah, again, like so talking about, I've not dealt with anything that big. And that's kind of always one of the kind of, I always feel bad going, I, am I really a big data person? Because you know you no no sure. you are you you are you are don't worry I'm I, it's it, it, it just you know just a call out to everybody else yes Simon absolutely is uh, I just happen to have really good stories on the most insane sizes that's all that's that's all this is that's actually not normal if it's normal for you to build a twenty four terabyte cube it, uh, you you need to start <laughs> like really not do that. That's the best answer I can about. Just not do that. Sorry. Okay. So go ahead. I, but I did want to call that out and, and add to your point there. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> yeah. I, so the, the gnarliest, which I look back kind of, I look back fondly on it with like a Stockholm syndrome kind of, this was like the thing that punished me. And it wasn't even that long a project. It was like, maybe like three, four months project, kind of like a fairly early in my consultancy life. You know, so I've been been working away as this reporting guy, done some MBX, joined a consultancy in my, towards the end of my first year of going, oh, okay, actually this is how all this cool stuff works. Um, there was a client who was doing some interesting stuff like market research, trying to do really like sort of, we want to compare that to that and that and that. And I was like, okay, this is fine. And you know, yeah. consultancy, client kind of goes, oh, and then, oh, and this, and it got to work like this, it got to work like this, 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 this. And doing it in MBX was just, it got gnarly. So essentially it's, you know, it's just a load of, uh, I think it's to do a load of dealer data, like sort of uh, car dealerships, spinning up a load of sales. Uh, and they're like, okay, and that needs to go to a sales org. So we need to roll up in an org hierarchy. Like, yeah, cool. And they're like, mm -hmm. uh, and that's, that's just, we do that by a parent child because it changes a lot. It's like, okay. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, 
parent tells are painful. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and they're like, and it needs to be slowly changing. So we need to be of able course. to track the point that the sales goes into there and then rolls up. And it's like, you want a slowly changing parent child done everything in a cube? And they're like, yeah. So we got <laughs> we kind of we got that working. And then they're like, no, 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 wait. So obviously, if you like, if a dealership moves into a different area, you know, mm-hmm. the, the parent total can't change. Like, right. Oh, you want you want a scoped assignment, parent, child, slowly changing. <laughs> oh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> absolutely, you would. No, no, I love doing scope assignments like that. They're, it doesn't slow down the performance at all. It would. It, yeah. So it was yeah. a thing of beauty. <laughs> the fact that we got this thing actually working, I was like, okay. I'm amazed that is actually accurate and gives you correct things. And they're like, it's not very fast. <laughs> just like, what do you expect? Uh, and yeah, I just keep looking back, like, stuff why these days, you know, kind of MDX isn't to be seen, no one goes near it. And it just makes me sad. I used to love MDX because some of the horrible, gnarly, mean oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. problems you get in it. Uh, but that one's always stuck with me as kind of like the, the kind of like goalpost just moving and me just like desperately trying to catch up with like just just growing and growing like MDX calculate script going, come on, please, no. Oh, no. oh no, I'm with you a thousand percent. I mean, exactly to your point, which is like, because I remember doing like additive measures myself and like, oh, distinct count. That was the bane of my existence, <laughs> the absolute bane. And which is so it, funny, it, right? These days, okay. that's yeah. like, great. Easy. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. But at the time, right at the time, the bane, right. And, but exactly to your point, right. I mean, in a lot of ways, actually your cubes, what you had to build was actually harder than mine, right. Because, because you actually had a lot of business logic, complex calculations that you had to go through so that you actually had to understand it wasn't even about getting the data from the storage engine. Oh, sorry. To provide context, analysis services had a formula engine, which is basically how it does its queries. And it had a storage engine. Storage engine was grabbing data from disk and chucking up to, 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 to memory. And the formula engine was actually the part that actually did the calculations. So in your case, Simon, a lot of your stuff was actually very formula engine heavy. In other words, it wasn't so much about getting the data off of disk. You just, once, once you got a disk, it was, it would actually take a long time for it to process yeah. the data in memory. So that wasn't, so it, yeah, that was your problem. Like, and so yeah. in a lot of ways, my problems were simpler, right? Because even though I was dealing with a massively large cube, right? Basically it was more about, can I speed up the disk fast enough? That was it. It was all about, can I get the, it, because if you think about the calculations, if I was to do semi-additive measures on a 24 terabyte cube, it, it's yeah. not going to work. Yeah, it's just it's just <laughs> not going to work. It, let's not bother the pretense, right? So I did simplify. We we did simplify the cube, right? Uh, hats off to Dave Mariani, uh, who actually was leading the project. So I I I want to call it that I helped him, not I wasn't the lead of it because I was at Microsoft. <laughs> so Yahoo's the one who created. So <laughs> shout out to Dave Mariani here. Okay, so but they, they went ahead and uh, um, it was just about getting the data into memory faster. Mm-hmm. So like you, you, if you look at some of the older presentations Thomas Kaiser and I did, it was things like, you know, we, we love SSDs, right? Because it allowed random IOPS so we could get the data from disk into memory fast enough. But then the formula engine queries that we had were like pizzly compared to stuff that you were doing, right? Mm-hmm. Like the slowly changing type do parent-child dimensions with semi-additive measures, right? Like that entire idea, we were like- you say like that. <laughs> But, but see, that's the thing. It, it, you, you actually call out the fact that big data isn't just about the size, right? It goes back to that old adage of the three Vs, right? It's about volume, oh, velocity. Oh, sorry. Sorry. No, no, you're right. No, uh, you're absolutely right. The four Vs, volumes, variety, uh, variability, uh, and uh, velocity, right? Exactly. The four Vs. Sorry. Uh, wait, wait. Volume. Yeah. Velocity. Yeah. Variety. Variability, variability. Uh, okay, yeah. okay. Well, no, no, what, what's your definitions then? I'd love, uh, yeah. So for us, the fourth is veracity. Oh, okay, I like that one, actually. And, and that okay, one kind of fair enough. In, um, more as a, a kind of reaction to the lake stuff. You know, so the fact that you kind of, the lakes kind of took off him and was like, I, I need to build a lake. 
And they started right. shoveling data into this thing like it was a network drive and just going, it's fine, it's cool, we can just store some data. Oh yeah, yeah, it's fine, exactly. And then no one had a clue what was going in there and no one could trust anything. And it's like, well, this thing is entirely pointless. Um, so I kind of like just like putting in veracity just as a, you still have to manage your data. It's, it's not magic, it still needs some kind of thing in there. Um, and that's like another real thing, right? You know, so talking big data, you know, yeah. and that's why I hate Please. data. Oh yeah, data. exactly. It, it's it's the nice bingo buzzword of the day. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're we're, uh, we're, 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 we're in violent right. agreement on that one. <laughs> oh, we okay? Oh no, no. Go ahead. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> the connections are weird. Uh, yeah. So like oh, okay. the number of people, and I say, you know, Spark's really good. Spark can help you out, and they go, oh, we don't have big data. And it's like, you, what do you mean? And they go, we don't, we, we don't have huge amounts of data. It's like, cool, but what, what kind of data are you doing? And like, oh, we're ingesting a live stream of like till data that's in fairly nested JSON. It's like, you have a big data problem. That, that, that is an exotic data type with some gnarly unstructured stuff in there that's coming in the stream. That's the very definition of dealing with a big data problem. They're like, but there's not that much data. <laughs> it's like, and that's like, what well, it's infuriates me. That everyone like sees this thing as this big. I don't need that tool because that tool is for people who are this tall. Gonna be this tall to ride kind of thing. Right. Um, so just like you know, kind of pulling those things out. As much as I hated the four Vs originally, because that's uh -huh. like you know, big data marketing, people getting a buzzword out. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. But it's like a great thing to have that conversation and go. It's not all of those four Vs. It's any of those four Vs. It can help with. Right, and and more importantly. The, the call out, because this is actually when I was calling out when when um, we originally, uh, so, oh, sorry, I forgot, I think I forgot to mention this, uh, uh, one of the projects I was involved with. Um, I was actually on the Project Isotope team. Uh, that was the team that actually uh, built what now is currently known as HD Insight. Okay, so we were the ones who brought Hadoop into Microsoft, uh, which was, that was a, a fun conversation to have with lots of people, by the way. Um, <laughs> but exactly to your point, what the, the it, it sounds very markety, Right, when you talk about big data, absolutely. And especially with the, the Vs, like three, four, eight, I don't care. Like just the, whatever the number is, right? But yeah, yeah. the but but I, number one, I like your four Vs, by the way. So I'm gonna stick with that. Volume, velocity, uh, variety, and veracity. I, I love that one, number one, okay? Uh, so we're in agreement, number one. Um, number two, what typically was what we would consider a big data problem wasn't the fact that you had volume and nothing else or velocity and nothing else. Because theoretically, you could then just have a single system handle volume, right? If it's just volume, you could just literally chuck it into uh, to, uh, Azure Blob Storage or you know, ADLS uh, Gen 2 and be done for the day, right? Um, or if it's, you know, uh, a velocity, you could literally write custom code for that type of thing or, and so yeah. forth and so forth, right? The problem was that you had all of the above or a com or some of them, like, you know, two of two of the four or whatever, right? And typically, especially in this day and age, it's really, in all seriousness, three of the four or four of the four anyways, right? Like, even if you don't have the volume aspect, you'll often have that velocity aspect, which is like, just yeah. like you said, streaming the JSON coming in. And then you have the the uh, the variety in terms of like, it's you're not just looking at one set of data, right? You're looking at JSON, plus you're looking yeah. at a database, plus some CSVs while you're at it, plus, you know, REST API calls for, for social or whatever else. And you got to combine all that together. And exactly to your point, veracity, right? This uh, in the entire idea that you actually need reliability underneath that, right? So the great thing about data lakes was that I could go ahead and chuck all my data in there and not worry about it. Oh, by the way, somebody just chimed in and said, is it possible to rewatch this? We actually put this on YouTube live concurrently as well. So you're more than welcome to go ahead and just watch it then. So anyways, uh, but back to my point, like if you have all this data coming in, the reality is you need to actually make sure it's reliable. You actually have to manage it. And so at this point, this is where I think, at least that's my guess, because, you know, in fact, I think this is only our second time we've actually talked together, even though even though we know each other, <laughs> this is actually our, only our second time talking. Um, this ultimately led us into not just obviously Spark Data Engineering, uh, even though we came from the SQL Server side of the house, but it also led us into things like Delta Lake because it brought us back to mm -hmm. asset transactions, 
like something we missed, something we loved actually having before. And so, yeah, I mean, Simon, what do you think? Like, you know, provide a little, uh, uh, paint the picture from, you know, from some of the projects that you've worked on, some of the customers that you're working with on some, uh, where all of a sudden you started hitting those roadblocks because great, I was able to store the data, but <laughs> oops, <laughs> I didn't validate. So my data is actually, <laughs> is, is SOL, right? So. <laughs> I mean, one of the things I want to pull out uh, just before stepping into that is kind of going back to, um, so Bob had that question about, you know, what about ETL, right? So mm -hmm. kind of oh, please, talking, yes, yeah, 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 absolutely. About, yeah, let's do that. Yeah. Huge, and we're talking about business logic and we're talking about encoding all the actual end calculations that you do at runtime on top of a, a semantic layer. Right. Um, and you know, you get across like it became. You get to a point when you know putting calculations in, you kind of like you know you can. There's an amount of domain understanding that you need for that, right? Right. And then from a consultancy point of view, you're going from client to client to client and seeing they had the same problems getting the data in there, the same problems making it trustworthy and quality, the same problems trying to just hop through the same things. That then became like the interesting tech problem of going. How do we just solve that? How do we make that that when we get to a client, we can just Go, yeah, fine. Getting the data in is easy. And then we can start fixing your actual business problem and start getting to the nuts and bolts of it. Right. Uh, I just went through, you know, kind of going through client after client after client and the tech is moving. And each time you do it, there's like a slightly better approach you can do to it. And then right. I now find myself looking back going, it's been a long time since I've actually looked at the customer data, honestly. You know, kind of it's, it's you know, you can build almost an abstracted, how do you manage data? And I don't care what the data is about. It's, you know, you care the shape of the data, how fast the data comes in, the volume of it, the, the requirements for doing that stuff. But then if you're a bank or if you're a retailer or if you're a kind of a marketing or whoever you are, actually, they all have the same data problems. You know, there, there, there's some real common similar data engineering style problems that you see across it. And that's when you start talking data engineering, right? So right. we mentioned about data engineering, but then when we started, we were BI ETL devs. And there's, exactly. like that, that kind of, there's a transition that people are making going, you know, I'm no longer just building an SSIS package so I can get it into a cube. I'm now designing a reusable data pipeline that I'm actually sort of programming and I'm actually having to take software engineering principles to make it decoupled and have a Microsoft service style architecture and all of that kind of stuff. And that's very, it's, it's a big shift. And I, I think that scares a lot of people. A lot of people are going, mm -hmm. going, oh, they're talking software engineering. They're talking coding standards. They're talking unit testing on a Python build, making a wheel. And that, that sounds so far away. Um, and it's, yeah, it, it has, things have changed in terms of what it takes to actually do that stuff. But for me, it's, um, so that it's, it's changed in terms of the amount of work has gotten much less, right? But it's just slightly more complex, you know, because it used to be you're back in, Back in SSIS days, which I keep saying back in SSIS days, then everyone's still using SSIS goes, oh, <laughs> but it's like, you know, the, 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 I've got, I've got a thousand different files I need to load in and you sit there copying and pasting a templated SSIS package and changing the connection and the next one and then the next one, or you write BIML script. And so business knowledge market language, awesome tool, but geez, just writing C sharp and XMLA and having to hack them together into a nested loop that then generates things for you on the fly is fairly painful, uh, to say the least. And, you know, kind of, uh, I, I'm fairly cheeky in that the, you know, DevOps story, right? right? So if you're using a code generator, it spits out, you know, thousands and thousands of things. And the, the work involved to make those thousands is much, much shorter using a code gen. But yes. then you've got to deploy those things. You've got, yes. to, you've got to still get them out. Yeah. And so that's, that takes DevOps and deployment and slick processes. Uh, whereas, you know, Spark and all the modern stuff, we can just write a generic reusable package that's metadata driven. So if you want to say, I want to onboard a new data set, that's then configuration. It's a bit of job to add a bit of metadata. Right. And like the whole, you know, the, the slogan is you can't deploy faster than not deploying, right? So if you right. can build a system that doesn't involve deployments, that's going to go faster no, no matter how good your code generation stuff is. And it's, it's like a whole evolution of thinking about that as a, as a almost isolated problem, right? So going from very much the customer trying to predict this value or they're trying to report on this thing. And it's all about that end user to taking steps back and you know, how do you do this smarter? How do I stop having the same pain every time to, oh, that's really good, but can't we even do it even better? Oh, that's a really cool tech. I could apply that in this, 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 this way. And then you just become more and more, it becomes a separate technical challenge of its own case. And that's super interesting to me and that that's where we are now and all these tools around 
Delta Lake and all these kind of uh, new technologies, they're all just evolutions of that same thing. It's all ways for us to make that slicker, remove work, remove pain. You know, so the way we've been building data lakes for ages, we use Parquet. Parquet's fantastic because it's cotton exactly. store and it's super fast for aggregations and all that. And then when you're saying, when your client's going, yeah, but I need, I still need like some Kimball style stuff. So can you make that slowly changing? Right. It's like slowly changing, it's just the bane of my life, follows me everywhere. And you're having to build something going, okay, so I've got like a gigantic table of Parquet. I've got some change coming in. So I need to write a script that says, lift them both up, compare the data frames, write that, that back, replace the existing one with this new one, write the other one into a history, merge them together. And you have this big script of stuff to do. Right. And then again, Delta comes along and says, cool, that's now a merge statement. It's like, great. <laughs> it's like, that's, that's my, my life is just hopefully taking buckets and buckets of script and going, okay, now it's just that much script. Okay, now it's that much script. Oh no, now, now it's just one command. And then life is just getting easier. Um, and that, that's what Delta is for me. Delta is just a whole bucket of utilities that mean a load of stuff that we could do before, just now takes a hell of a lot less work and it's just a lot more approachable. And approachable is like the key, right? That whole imposter syndrome. I can't do big data. I'm not, I'm not a big, I'm never, I don't, I don't write Scala. I, don't, I didn't do MapReduce back then. Being able to say, you know what? Actually, if you can write a bit of SQL, you can actually use Delta and you can start doing things that encapsulates all of the parquet, all of the big data stuff, all of the big massively parallel processing distributed engine stuff is a lot. Basically, if you can write a bit of SQL, you can now use a load of it. And that's cool. And that's a big, the big shift that for me has happened in the past. It's only really the past three years, past three, four okay. years that that's become that approachable. Gotcha. But previously you could do it, but it took an element a bit more of engineering and config and setting up and, you know, so HD Insight, you know, oh. just the number of components that you have to kind of, the number of dominoes you need in a row to get it, right. well, you know, Uzi and all these other things that you have to get a lot. Oh yeah, yeah. It's it my favorite thing to set up an Uzi job. It was completely my favorite thing to do. <laughs> Uh, but I, I came fairly late to that stuff, honestly, because I, I went uh, a, a meandering uh, Azure route. So we started using Azure kind of as soon as we could. We're like, hey, look, we've got a giant SQL server. Let's let's split that SQL server up into an SSIS job and the SSRS and the AS, yes. put them in separate VMs. And then I can turn bits of it off when I'm not using it. I'm saving some money. It's like, yeah, good. And then, you know, Data Factory V1 came out and it was just... The biggest bag of spanners known to man is like great, um, but like we did, we went down the whole path of uh, data lake analytics. That was my first real kind of foray into that stuff. Okay, um, gotcha. Like, okay. Writing, going, writing new SQL, you know, because I've been writing went to C sharp for various different things and going, okay, I can't, it's it's like C sharp and SQL jammed together. I, I get this. I think this makes sure, sense. Sure, to me. Sure. And building code generators, right? To spin up ADLA jobs. They went on demand. And that's like, that's great. I'm not having to, I'm not having to build anything. I've got a little Azure function that on the fly writes some new SQL scripts, kicks the job off. That does some stuff. I, I don't need to write SSIS anymore. <laughs> it's just like happy, happy days. And then from that, you know, that evolved and that kind of future uncertainty kind of things, Databricks came released. Um, I managed to sneak on, I was, so there was a Microsoft internal training course for like some, uh, some of the Microsoft's like CSA or yeah, yeah. Uh, SPs. D DSAs, back. yeah, exactly, yeah. Um, and me as a partner, we were like, you know, we're, oh, we're super interested in Databricks. And they're like, we can sneak you in. So it's like me and another guy just like the only people who weren't Microsoft in the room going, they've not noticed, it's cool. Uh, when they were first doing the Databricks rollout in uh, in the UK. Um, and then, you know, we just like just trying, to, trying to use it, trying to piece it in. So, that, and that's fairly late in terms of Spark, right? We're, yeah. already, we're already talking 2.4. We've already got data frames. I'm not having to go and rummage around the buckets of RDDs and access of all that kind of stuff. Oh, which... come on. Why don't you want to play with RDDs? Why don't you want to write all the code in Scala? Come on, why not? <laughs> <laughs> well, that, well, that's fairly late to the party, right? That's kind of what, three, right. four, five years ago, four years ago? I don't know. Uh, in, that, yeah. in the grand scheme of Spark, that's become so much easier. I'm looking at it like, as like, you know, kind of going, Wow, I am so glad I didn't start back in 2012 when it was literally just hand cranking things going. But yeah, so like when you when you like to uh, when you used to spark then when you did your, your hop, was that RDD lens? Was that kind of? Crazy? Oh, absolutely! No, no, I was involved with Spark back in 
0.7. Yeah. So when the project was still in Berkeley, right? So I was yeah. I was starting to mess around with it then. Um, <clears throat> shortly after we made HD Insight beta, like um, when it was when the the name Isotope was still prevalent, and yeah. and by the way, by the way, there's only like nine of us that created this project, which was pretty sweet. Um, I had already dove into Spark because I reckon we, a bunch of us who had been working on the project recognized like some of the issues with Hadoop, right? Which was that it, it allowed us to process massive amounts of data, which was great. Like, especially for the scenarios that we were trying to address, right? Yeah. Like the ones, right. The, the, there wasn't the same level of clarity that like that, for example, that you have right now, right? The, the, at the time it was just more like you couldn't process that data period. So it wasn't about speed anymore. It was just about the fact that I couldn't even do it, right? Like uh, like, like with the, the sheer, um, like at the time terabytes, uh, hundreds of terabytes was considered a really hard thing to do. And we were approaching petabytes already at that time. This is like 10 years ago, right? Like, so, so, you know, that, that's why we had no choice but to distribute the problem. We had no choice but to go chuck it up. And so, yeah, and so because of the, the, we inherently understood the issues um, that result, that revolved around Hadoop. We, a bunch of us actually decided to dive into Spark as well. And exactly to your point, RDDs. Yes, we were definitely playing in that land. Uh, it was a while before we had, uh, uh, um, Michael Armbrist and Matei had introduced this concept of schema RDDs, which of course became now what is now known as data frames, right? Uh, back in Spark 1.0 to 1.3, that time frame, right? Um, and so uh, it was, the funny story was that actually I had a, a regular sync with my friends at Yahoo because you know, the, the 24 terabyte cube, right? And what ended up happening is but purely by accident, we end up having all of our meetings end up being about Spark. So it was, it was just like, oh, okay. Well, I, it wasn't like I was telling them Spark or they were telling me, it was just, we just, we, we both came to that conclusion in separate ways. Like, yeah. which was, to the, at least in our case, it was just because, like I said, it was just purely about, it was that large we couldn't process it, so we had to have distribution, and but we still wanted at least it not to take three days <laughs> to process I mean, the data. I, I right. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I'm just saying, you know, this is a, yeah, exactly. We, I mean, I realized we couldn't ask for the query to come back in minutes, or, or you know, like a la BI cube or anything like that. But yeah. I did want to not run the query, wait three days, and recognize the fact that because I forgot to put a colon here. <laughs> or a dot here that that entire query failed right like I, I did i wanted to avoid that problem right so so invariably that's what led us to spark and then exactly to your point you know work with larger and larger customers on spark which was pretty nice um and it was pretty sweet right um the idea that all of a sudden these queries that would take maybe hours now we're taking like, you know, minutes. And so yeah. that, and then, but yes, exactly to your point. Uh, actually the running joke. And so was that because of, I was actually trying to initially work with Hadoop, right. In terms of actually working with the internals and all that stuff. And then of course, invariably uh, that led to working with Spark and it's internals. So don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to pretend that I'm really good at what I'm doing. I'm not, I'm, I'm okay. <laughs> right. Um, I started writing a lot of my code, of course, in Scala. Right. And then, and so uh, the reason I wanted to just do a real interesting call out is because Holden Corral, she's one of the uh, one of the awesome people that was able to push forward with PySpark, right? So because you know why we have PySpark, uh, I mean, don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to discredit other people. I'm just simply calling out there there are a lot of really good people that, and Holden was one of those people, right? That yeah. helped push through PySpark. The the reason I'm calling out this running joke is because as I started diving into data science. Of course, I did Py. I just started doing Python myself, and then did PySpark. But when she wanted to do performance, she started getting to Scala. So invariably, even though I started in Scala and she started uh, a la PySpark, uh, her most recent Spark book uh, um, uh, was written in primarily in Scala. I.e., I, the person to help us create PySpark is now writing in Scala, and then my first. Uh, book in in Spark was which is learning PySpark. That book. Um, 
actually was well, well, obviously written in Python, even though it was a skull engineer first. And so, yes. Uh, and at that time that as the evolution happened, I was perfectly happy saying, oh, it's bouncing back for in Scala and Python. In fact, here's a shameless plug to Learning Spark, you know, that, that book right there, <laughs> <laughs> and which I, I'm glad to be a, a co-author of. And what's, what's interesting is exactly to your point, as we progressed, as we worked with more customers, all of a sudden, all the things that were awesome about SQL Server, that I loved about SQL Server, like things like asset transactions, the manageability, the, the fact that we needed to be able to do everything in SQL as opposed to writing reams of code. Now, 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 now nothing like XMLA, that was insanity on its own right, okay? But I do mean like writing, like at least it wasn't Java. So at least it wasn't like, like writing like the reams of Java code, but still I would write like Scala code or exactly to your point, like the merge statement, like, you know, now with Spark, actually the Scala API is actually pretty smooth too. But the idea originally what I had to write in Scala versus right now a simple little merge statement is in SQL. Yeah, exactly to your point. Like the, as time progresses and as people who, in some ways I wish I didn't hadn't, I mean, obviously I don't wish I didn't have to do it, but in terms of if I was starting from a data warehousing perspective, oh boy, yeah, it'd be, it's a lot simpler to jump to it now because with Spark SQL, you, you have the friendliness and the awesomeness and the power of your SQL language, yet it actually can be distributed, which is awesome sauce, yeah. right? And at the same time, the idea that now we have Delta Lake, it allowed us to go ahead and actually have asset transactions. And the combined combination of the two together allowed, especially with the, some of the uh, the APIs that were included in, in Spark 3.0 with Delta Lake 0.7.0, that allowed us to actually significantly simplify the manageability of a distributed system because we all know a distributed system actually is harder to maintain, not easier to maintain. Like if I was to maintain a single SQL Server instance, that's actually not that hard. If I'm trying to maintain 50 of them, that, that's a little tricky. Yeah, just just yeah. a little bit. So yeah. So. <laughs> but the, those, those kind of hooks, you know, you always, so so many clients are uh, like we work with, they've gone like, you know, kind of someone, someone high up has gone, we're having a mo modern platform. We're going to get people in who are going to put a modern platform in. And we speak to the warehousing guys and they're like, oh, I don't want to learn Scala. I don't want to learn Python. That's like, <laughs> but they're just looking in terror, uh, you know, kind of this enthusiastic consultant coming in going, hey guys, we've got an amazing distributed system. We're going to do some cool stuff. And then you guys go, uh, and then you start working and it's like, how'd you get data in? Okay, well, this is a merge statement. And like, wait, what? <laughs> it's just like this anchor point of familiarity. And, you know, we teach them uh, PySpark and we teach them, you know, you can have a merge statement, put some parameters in and have a single merge statement that you can use for any of your data sets. And that's just all kinds of awesome. And you see like the little, light bulbs going, oh God, that's going to save us so much work. That's awesome. Right. right. Um, oh, and, and, and to add to Simon's point, the whole reason why he loves merge, and, and so do I, by the way, I'm, I'm not trying to, I'm just, is because the merge is an upsert, i.e. insert and update, but also includes deduplication and also includes schema evolution. So it, it, it's one statement that covers all of those things, which is, Boy, sweet. <laughs> <laughs> Which, again, in, in my little journey of, you know, my, my life, my life is basically saying, I want to write less code as I get older. <laughs> like, not, not I want to code less, just when I code, I just want to write like small. Right, 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 right. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Agreed. I, I don't want to write yeah. reams of this stuff just because, you know, full well, every extra character you add in is a, is a, is, is a point where you might fail. <laughs> And I'm just ham-fistedly going, going oh, yeah, 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 that's probably going to work. So, okay, that, we actually only right. have 16 minutes left. And I just, so this Ooh. went, we went a little longer than we thought we went. But all right, actually, let's dive right into some of the questions because actually this is a good segue. So first example, uh, let's go back to the first one, which is, um, I understand Delta Lake from previous presentations, but what is what are what is a lake house? Like why are lake houses important? So we actually covered it without actually explicitly calling out. So why don't you start and uh, and then I'll chime in as well for that matter. Okay. Um, so <sighs> succinctly, 
data lakes have an absolute ton of flexibility and power and all that crazy big data -y stuff of saying different kinds of exotic data types, vast amounts of data streaming, all that kind of stuff. Data lakes are awesome at it. But structurally, having that kind of, hey, I've got a schema. I, I know what structure this data is. I'm doing some regulatory reporting and I need to actually manage this thing. I don't want to need it to come in and just accidentally delete my data because they've got access to that. All of that kind of stuff has always historically been a little bit flaky in the data lake land. Now, over on the warehouse side, you've got all of that. So transactional consistency, management of schemas, deployability, control, auditing, awesome. And then, you know, you try and get JSON in there and it's like, oh, we've got a JSON column now. You know how to write for JSON path things, right? And everyone goes, oh God. And it's just like, there's so many things that are just hard. And especially these days when people are going, there's some new data, we've got an opportunity. Can we take advantage of that new data? And like traditional warehousing teams are going, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Our next production replace, uh, next production deployment is scheduled for three weeks time. Is that soon enough? I mean, I know three weeks is being generous. Normally we're talking, you know, kind of monthly cadences. At the end of this project, we might do a deployment. And then by that point, you've missed the boat. You know, so it's missing out on all the stuff in the lake that you can do just, you know what, actually bring some data in. Let's do some generic landing of some data and we'll figure out what we want to do with it later. And like there's, there's kind of the two different sides of the fence. So for me, like the whole lake house point is a technological technological solution to enable so much of the warehousing goodness, but based on a lake to get all the goodness of a lake. So it's kind of like, why not both? Um, and it's awesome. That's kind of how we see it. Perfect. Well, I mean, I don't think I could do it much better. I, I I'll just do the short the short phrase tagline, which basically is uh, best of both worlds of data warehousing and data lakes. Uh, the manageability of warehouses with the flexibility of lakes, right? That, that's the, the marketing tagline, but you yeah. dive in a little bit deeper when you, it, I think Simon called it out perfectly, right? The, the reality is like, we're not done yet. There's obviously things, the community as a whole, whether it's the Spark community or the Delta Lake community, um, or just the, the overall data community, you know, uh, we still have more work to do. Let's let's call let's call a spade a spade here. Like, there are things that we can do to improve, but the reality is that's what lake houses are, which is to say that you know, for me, like okay, actually, I, I know this sounds like a, a like I'm going off track a little bit, but in fact, it's actually an important component. Like when when Simon and I started talking about our past, it's not just because we're reminiscing. Okay, I mean, yes, we are too. Okay, but but the reason why we're doing this is because. Uh, there's a fundamental concept that there's actually a model that's supposed to be applied to your data, right? There's actually, the, your data is actually important, right? When we went to lakes, the whole premise is that we were just trying to chuck the stuff in as fast as we could. So we kept on saying things, things, things like schema on read, schema on read, schema on read. We'll, we'll worry about the schema later. We'll worry about the schema later. We'll, we'll worry about what, if it's important later, right? And there is value to that statement, by the way. I'm not saying there is no value to that statement. Quite the opposite. You don't know if the data is any interesting until you actually put it to a point where you can query it. So that, that so that's completely true. But at the same time, we I think we went a little too far, right? Yeah. Which was, we forgot that, no, no, but we, we weren't so just to store it. We needed to actually go read it and do something with it. And build a model on it, i.e. the schema is the model for your data, right? We needed to do things like that. So that way people remember what the value of that. We, we have these awesome marketing, and I'm being very facetious when I say this, awesome marketing taglines like, oh yeah, there's uh, the new the, the new oil is data or the new gold is data or whatever, you know, that, that type of BS, right? And that's a, that's a great marketing tagline, but the, 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 but the fact is, the truth of statement, if even if I was to follow the marketing tagline, is that yeah, there's a lot of work though, right? Oil doesn't just automatically come on the ground and automatic pro a process, right? Data is the same thing, right? So it required us to do a lot of things to to make sense of it. And so the so for me, it's not just about manageability; it's also about re remembering the value of your data and reapplying that back, which is why lake houses are so important to me because it's not just the technical construct 
or, the, or you know, like you sometimes hear us say paradigm and immediately enough, that's a marketing term. So I, I, so I apologize for using that. But the reason we often use the word paradigm uh, is, because it's not, is because it's not just a tactical innovation, but it's also saying, I love my data, right? It's also saying, I, I respect the value of my data, right? Massively. And I think that's a, a crucial call out that isn't necessarily always covered. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I, I did. Uh, so I wrote a blog post, uh, I think like six months ago or so, which was pure clickbait of saying, you know, is Kimball still relevant in, in, a, in a day like? <laughs> sure, sure. <laughs> it's like, just there's like a little fishing rod going. <laughs> um, yeah, I got it. <laughs> and, but then, you know, like, so, you know, my, my take on that is, is so Kimball and Starskeepers and stuff is a thing that was almost entirely designed for relational databases because of the way relation databases work. And that kind of makes sense. Right. And then there's a ton of like evolution that's become on it, which is all the data management um, patterns and things like slowly changing and things like well, auditing lineage columns and things like making a, a fact table with all your um, data quality lineage data and calling that an audit fact. And a ton of that is just data management. And right. you can do that in a lake really easily. And it, you know, so it used to be, you know, if you had like some kind of fact table and dimension tables, that didn't perform too well in Spark. But Spark 3, because we've got like sort of uh, the dynamic partition uh, pushdown, so you can actually filter your date table, have that actually correctly filter your facts. Suddenly that unlocks all that stuff. That stuff's mm -hmm. a hell of a lot easier to do. So you can actually get a lot of the fairly, which if you talk to a big, big data person and say, I am doing Kimball in my lake, they go, oh, oh no, <laughs> you're one of them. But then there's still a ton of goodness in it. It's the thing it should, it's not saying it should only be Kimball, right? Agree, agree, uh, agree. agree. Well, you know, you know, you know, everyone, everyone always ends up having three zones to your lake, right? You yeah, end exactly. three stages, a, we call it raw, base, enriched. You guys call it bronze, silver, gold. People call it one, two, and three. I don't care. You've got exactly. It doesn't matter the name, the concept, uh, the, the fact that you have a data quality framework of some type. Yeah. Relevant to what you call it, that's what you have. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So you can yeah. go to a certain part of your lake and, you know, the data in there, that has been, that is just as it came. I, I, I need enter at your own risk. You need to be able to understand the data. That might not be right. Middle bit, that data's been sanity checked. It's been sense checked. It's had some quality cleaning done. You can go and trust it, but it's still in its original format. So requires a bit of skill to figure it out and know what's going on there. And then some kind of curated, this is, this is managed trustworthy. This has been shaped for ease of querying. Now, sometimes facts and dimensions make sense for that because of the kind of data and the kind of people you're showing it to. Sometimes it's a big wide reporting table. Sometimes it's a mix of the two in some other shape. And that's absolutely fine. And that's just options, right? That's just that you, we now have the flexibility for all of the different data management paradigms that we've used to get in so many different places. They can actually fit, and there's no longer a technological barrier saying you have to use this way, you have to use it. You're not allowed to do a style scheme. You've got right. to be one them. It's now a manage the, manage the data in a model that makes sense for your business purpose, which is great. Right. Uh, exactly. enable, enabling all of that stuff is just maturity, right? It's right. rather than being a fair kind of wild west, we can get kind of get it to work. It's just a, no, this stuff just works. You can fit, you can design your data for your business, which is a huge shift. Right. And, and actually, to, exactly to your point. So uh, this is a slightly plug for the Databricks YouTube channel, but I did want to call out that like in the Databricks, this data and AI online meetup that you're on right now in the Databricks YouTube channel, we actually have videos a la Kimball uh, talking about surrogate key generation, uh, the importance of them, right? For Delta Lake, for data lakes. Uh, slowly changing type two dimensions in your data lake, right? CDC <laughs> in your data lake, right? It, it's yep. so exactly to Simon's point. It's like, I get the idea of using this, these techniques. And in some cases, people are going like, why would you try to apply that to, you know, a data warehousing technique to a data lake? And I'm going like, well, because it, it's not like the concept was wrong. The concepts actually make a ton of sense. It's just that now with, you know, Spark, especially with Spark 3.0 and, 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 and Delta Lake, I'm actually able to do that now, right? Like, like I couldn't do that before, or at least it would just like someone was calling out reams and reams of code that I actually had to go, go through in order to be able to handle that. I'm like, yeah, all right, there you go, right. Yeah, so previously it was a square box. I had a massively round peg of just trying to squeeze into it and try to force into it. Right. Well, it's not to say that absolutely everything still stands, right? You know, oh, of, course. Be, of course. Old yeah. warehousing days. If you ever had a string or, sorry, if you ever had a var chart on your fact table, then you are the devil. 
And that's just not true anymore. You know? Right, right. right. That, that's fine. You can denormalize some things onto your fact table for ease of querying because actually parquet, column law compression, dictionaries, run length encoding, all of that stuff squeezes down really nicely. It's exactly. Fine. Exactly. But still, there's some stuff. So that that's like the, the use case, right? If you've got like right. a, a a conformed dimension, you've got like sure. a, a product hierarchy and you need to manage that. If you're insisting on having your big wide reporting tables and then you need to change how your product hierarchy works and you suddenly have to regenerate all of your giant transaction reporting tables for that one value that's changed, like that's a huge amount of work. Yes. Is if you have a, a separate table that encodes how we talk about that particular logical entity, you could call it like a dimension if you wanted to. Uh, exactly. And that yes. just makes sense. So like there's so many of those ideas that you can use and go, but that still makes still makes sense. Um, but yeah, I, but for a long time, it was very much the, you weren't one of the cool kids. You weren't, you weren't a cool kid if you're trying to do like sort of traditional data modeling in, in big data land. But it's, people do, people want to do that. And those things make sense to business and that's how they think about their data in a lot of places. So why not enable people to work with how they want to work and not make it a tech value, which is awesome. Cool. Okay. So right. you know what? We're probably going to need to wrap up in two minutes. I just realized because we, <laughs> we're running, we're running long. So for all the people that uh, have asked questions in both YouTube live and the Q and a or the chat, we apologize for not getting to all of them. I just want to start off with that. Um, based on the feedback that we're getting, it looks, sounds like Simon, you and I probably should do this a couple more times. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so, so we'll definitely plan to do So what I encourage you to do, if you can do me a small favor, since this is actually also on YouTube live, obviously for the folks on YouTube, you're going to know it, uh, for, for the folks on the zoom, I had already propped it into chat, the link to this video. Why don't you take your questions and prop them right into YouTube? And the reason we want you to prop them into YouTube is because that way Simon and I can go through those questions. We'll answer some of them on it, but more importantly, that'll be the basis for our next chat. Yeah. <laughs> How's that? And I promise I won't rant as much about Kimball. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's okay. I'm a Kimball guy too. All right. So most people, mo a, a lot of my sequel server friends are like, are, are like, like, how can you say you're a Kimball guy when you went into Hadoop? And I'm like, you know what? It's, there, there is a fairness to that statement. There really is. Okay. So I'm not going to go ahead and actually disagree with that. But the thing is that, uh, as you can probably tell, I, it's not like I've ever lost my data warehousing roots. It's just that it had to scale to a point where, you know, for in my case, at least, the data sizes kept on getting exceedingly larger. <laughs> That's all right. And exactly you to your point. Yeah. Like when you spend your entire life just building gigantic workarounds to get around the limitations of the technology, and then you take a step back and go, wait, what, why are we working so hard to satisfy the bounds of that? When that's that's not what the business wants. That's not what I want to do it. It's just we're having to do it to get over a hump. And then you take a step away and you go, oh God, this is easier. <laughs> <laughs> All right, dude. Okay. Let's wrap it up. Uh, we're going to have to go. Um, I did want to call out two things again. One, the YouTube link is there. Put your questions since we're, since we did not answer your questions uh, and there are too many, we apologize. Uh, Simon and I obviously are having a little too much fun here. So <laughs> put them onto YouTube. Uh, chime in there. We're going to use those as the basis for our next show. Uh, Simon and I'll find another time to do this. Number one, number two, we, we uh, small plug. We do have a show next week um, on the 24th. Um, so come join us for that. Oh, so that's a, a completely different show on the automation of PySpark. It's actually the Data Collab Lab with Franco and myself. So it'll be a little bit of fun there. It's also very much SQL, uh, SQL centric. So you, I definitely would love you guys to join for that. But yes, based off of this feedback, we'll, we'll, we'll make your Simon and myself, we'll, we'll find another time. We'll definitely answer your questions. Uh, Simon. Well, we do have another drink. We're Please, make one no, no, that's what I was gonna say. You, you have the final word, my friend. Okay. Yes. Uh, well, next week we are both at Big Data London. Uh, no, no, I'm not at Big Data London, but uh, my boss, uh, Ali, is going to be Big Data London. No, 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 it's okay. We're still going to be there. I just, I can't go for other reasons. That's the reason why. That's all. Sorry. So yeah, Ali's doing a keynote on this is the Data Lake House. This is why we yes. did this whole thing. Uh, I'm doing a session which is actually here's all the actual individual bits of Delta which enabled Data Lake House. So that's something you guys are interested in. Big Data London happening next week on 
Wednesday, Thursday, I'm going to say, but again, just yeah, Google that. Let's, let's go with that. Let's Google big data London in quotes. You'll, you'll see Simon's session and you'll see Ali's session and we're good to go. All right. We got to jump. Uh, thank you very much, everybody. Simon, why don't you do the final word, my friend? Uh, yeah. Well, again, thanks for coming. Uh, again, you've got your YouTube channel. I've got my YouTube channel. So look out for Advancing Analytics. And we're talking all things DataRick and Spark. And a little bit of sign up at the moment. So investigating this Microsoft Spark and DataRick Spark and seeing how they fit. Uh, but yeah, any questions on that stuff, just give us a shout and line up some more stuff for us to chat about. Yes. Perfect. Awesome. Thanks very much, everybody. Thank you, Simon, for joining. Uh, we'll do this soon. All right. Take care, everybody.